Very soon we will realize that we are not the most intelligent entities on, on Earth. To the question of whether we have a neighbor, a cosmic neighbor, let's find out because then we can adapt to it. With the U.S. Department of Defense actively investigating hundreds of UAP or UFO cases and 157 international scientists calling to fast-track consciousness research in light of rapid AI developments, there's a sudden urgency to understand minds beyond our own in the universe. In this interview with UAP field investigator and astrophysicist Avi Loeb, we debrief on his expedition to recover droplets called spherules that form from high-energy impacts when space objects hit the Earth, that Loeb is investigating to see if they're possible remnants of alien tech. But the main reason I reached out to Loeb is about a theory from renowned biologist Stuart Kaufman, who discovered the experimentally validated mechanism and leading candidate to explain how non-living matter in the universe can emerge as life from a state poised at the edge of chaos between order and disorder. Kaufman's new theory says that consciousness and the universe emerge from a similar pattern of behavior baked into fundamental physics. This video accompanies my article in Forbes that includes interviews with Nobel laureate Adam Rees. Both Rees and Loeb share insights on investigating science's greatest mysteries and what it takes for revolutionary ideas to break through. Before I ask you about the thing I actually need to interview you about, I wanna ask you about the spherules just to kind of follow the saga. What I read is you were like, I'm gonna check this out. It hit, the, it's in the ocean. Nobody else is checking, I'm gonna go check it out. You went, you collected it and then you sent it out for analysis. I read in October, somebody said we did a chemical analysis as a chemical composition of coal ash. So it's not, it's not from outer, it's not, I don't know how you say this properly. So it's not extraterrestrial technology. Where is this landed? Right, so this is science. Uh, it's not about opinions. And what's strange about those opinions is when I came back with the materials from the expedition to the Pacific Ocean, that by the way, cost one and a half million dollars, took us a year to plan. We were there for two weeks, worked around the clock. I didn't sleep much, collected 850 spherules, which are molten droplets from meteors when they burn up in the fireball that they create as a result of their friction on air. So we brought back this material from the site that was identified by the US government satellites. So on the way back with the materials in my hands, I see, I check the internet and I see that uh, there was a paper published in the Astrophysical Journal by two astronomers claiming, we don't believe the US government, they must have been wrong. This was actually a stone from the solar system. And for that to be the case, the velocity has to be three times slower. So they said the data is wrong by the US government. Now, this is the US Space Command, which gets $40 million, $40 billion from the US government per year, more than NASA, to alert the US president for any incoming ballistic missile, let's say from North Korea. So if they were getting the numbers wrong by a factor of three, you should be really worried about the taxes that you're paying. I reached out to U.S. Space Command and United States Space Force to ask if they wanted to revise or confirm their analysis of additional Department of Defense data that supports Loeb's assessment that the meteor came from outside our solar system because a civilian meteor physicist and an astronomer used publicly available fireball data, which is data about especially bright objects from space that crashed to Earth. They used this public data to try to infer what kind of classified detection equipment the DOD uses, and then they published a critique in the Astrophysical Journal, challenging both Loeb and the U.S. government's claim that the meteor came from outside our solar system. The government agency rep I spoke with was unable to provide an on-the-record comment. However, Loeb's team determined the composition of a small number of spherules appear different from both materials made by humans and analyzed materials from our solar system. And while they remain cautious about their findings, they're calling for further investigations. These results have been peer-reviewed and are in press for publication with the journal Chemical Geology at the time of this reporting. Those astronomers published a paper saying they're wrong by a factor of three. Otherwise, we can't get our model to, to agree with the data, uh, assuming that these are stones. And I say, I say these are this is the stone age of science, where everything in the sky must be stone. We went there, we brought the material, 850 spherules. I gave them to two, primarily two laboratories, one at Harvard University that is led by my colleague, Professor Stein Jacobson, a world-renowned geochemist. The second one, at the Brucker Corporation in Berlin, Germany, led by Dr. Roald Tagel. And they were, both laboratories were using state-of-the-art instruments, the best in the world. And it took eight months to do the analysis. But 
while we were still working on the analysis. In the middle of it, we came back at the end of June. In October, a number of people started saying it's coal ash. So that was a person that never worked on meteors, but decided to come out with this statement. And another person whom I don't know at all. And then two people from Arizona State University. Now you have to realize those people have no access to the materials. And why would they make a statement? Why would the two astronomers publish a paper while we are back from the expedition saying that this meteor was from the solar system made of stone when we have the materials? Why not just wait and see what we find? And it tells you that they are motivated by, they have some ulterior motives. They have an agenda. They want to trash. They want to step on any flower that rises above the grass level because it bothers them. And they would invent stories. Now, reporters see them saying it's collage, see me saying we are still analyzing it, we think it's a unique composition, and they think it's like a political debate where you have to present both sides. Well, that's not the way it's done in science. If one side has no data, no access to the materials, and the other side is conducting the, the analysis, you need to pay attention to the side that is doing the work because you can sit on your chair and have an opinion on anything, which is true in politics. But in science, you have to do the work, once again, to find the evidence, analyze it, and come out with scientific results. It's a lot of work. So we did this work, eight months. We ended up with the results a, a couple of weeks ago, and we put the, we published one paper already, and we have an extended paper that is now out uh, posted and is being refereed right now. In those papers, we show the analysis of 850 spherules, which demonstrates, first of all, when we look at those special type of spherules that we found, 10% of the 850 appear to be of material composition that was never seen in the solar system. They have enhancements of elements like beryllium, lanthanum, uranium, and others, many others. We looked at 60 elements, up to a thousand times more than in the standard solar materials, the materials that made the solar system. So we call them Belau spherules for beryllium, lanthanum, uranium. When we look at those carefully, we see that they have nothing to do with coal ash. We compare them to coal ash. No, it's not the same. It's very different. And so it's not coal ash, to answer your question. So worth mentioning here is that the hypothesis that an asteroid impact wiped out the dinosaurs was proposed as recently as 1980, and paleontologists ridiculed it. So by 1988, physicist and eventual Nobel Prize winner Luis Alvarez, who had proposed the asteroid theory, he was publicly denouncing paleontologists as not very good scientists. Then in 1991, the Chicxulub creator was discovered, and the Alvarez asteroid dinosaur killing hypothesis started to gain widespread acceptance. Yet scientists still giggled at the idea that there might be any risk of an asteroid hitting us today. That's until the 1990s. In 1994, astronomers witnessed a massive asteroid collide with Jupiter, providing chilling real-time evidence of large impacts happening in our modern solar system, which inspired the 1998 Hollywood blockbusters Deep Impact and Armageddon. And that same year, NASA established the Near-Earth Object NEO program and started to receive an influx of funding to search for dangerous nearby space rocks. From there, rapid advancements in sensors and other detection technology means we're now tracking 35,575 near-Earth objects, mostly rocky asteroids with a few small rocky icy comets. A small number of these are being monitored because they could pose a potential risk, and there's still parts of the sky that we're still searching. We've also identified 75,877 meteorites, which are space objects that survived the fiery descent through our atmosphere and land on our planet. These numbers are constantly updating and went up by a few hundred in the time between writing this little explainer and recording. It's a remarkable reversal from the rejection of the very idea of meteors as pseudoscience in the 1700s, because Newton said space must be empty for gravity to work properly, and reports of meteors were considered fables told by superstitious country folk. So we've gone from space rocks as pseudoscience to tracking a thousand foot asteroid that will pass closer to Earth than some of our satellites in 2029. Loeb now thinks space rock skepticism has morphed to, well, okay, there are tens of thousands of space rocks over our heads and some are a bit worrisome, but they're still definitely just rocks and definitely not anything else. Again, for Loeb, this is more confirmation bias where we search or don't search for only the evidence we expect to find. I read the analysis that it was not likely to be 
Interstellar or whatever the the, the, the sort of armchair analysis from, from the two gentlemen. In this case, the issue of whether it's interstellar or not is just to do with the measurement of velocity of the object when it collided with Earth. And what happened was that the U.S. Space Command reported the original data and they did not provide uncertainties because the uncertainties are really small. I mean, they, they don't want to let adversar adversarial nations know how well they can measure speeds of fireballs in the atmosphere. When I reached out to them and asked them to look into the data again, it took them three years and they, you know, they put time, they put people, I know specifically there were many people involved looking at the data. They came back with a letter to NASA in March 2022 stating at the 99.999% confidence, we confirmed that this object came from outside the solar system because it was moving too fast. That was already there, yet the astronomers do not, you know, they don't want to believe it. They say we don't believe those people who have the data. Do you think that that's why, that's one of the reasons NASA announced the team to examine UAPs and look for available data and figure out the best ways to collect future data? No, the reason for that was that I approached NASA. So that was when the first report was submitted to Congress by Avril Haines, the Director of National Intelligence, reported three times to the U.S. Congress about unidentified anomalous phenomena. And when I met her, uh, Avril Haines, at the Washington National Cathedral, I said to her, what do you make of these objects that you reported about? And she said, I don't know. And I believe her. And uh, around that time, Bill Nelson, the head of NASA, stated on CNN that uh, he really wishes that scientists will get engaged to figure out the nature of these objects. And so the following morning, I wrote an email to the person responsible for science in NASA under Bill Nelson. He, at the time, it was uh, Thomas Zurbuchen. And I said, that I'm here to make your boss happy. So I'll, I'm, I'll be glad to help you explore those unidentified objects scientifically. And he immediately called me on the phone and I, we spoke and he said, why don't you send a white paper explaining why you want, why this is important. So I wrote a white paper, sent it to him and I never heard back. And so after a month, I established the Galileo project as a result of donations that I received. Uh, when people saw my book, Extraterrestrial, there were multi-billionaires that they offered money for me to continue this research. And then a year later, NASA announced that they established a committee to look into those unidentified anomalous phenomena and recommend to NASA whether to invest in research related to them. And so I wrote to Zurbuchen and I said, look, I'm very disappointed because you didn't get back to me. And then I suddenly hear in the news, not from you, that there is this committee. And so he said, well, we couldn't really appoint you to the committee because you're already involved in the research. And I thought to myself, well, if someone works on climate change and there is a committee that NASA establishes to study, to decide whether to invest in the research on climate change, would you not invite the person who already works on climate change? So anyway, the bottom line is they established the committee and the committee after a year basically submitted a report that concluded that more that scientific research needs to be done on this subject, which is what we've been doing with the Galileo project anyway. Do you think it's because you're too enthusiastic about it and they want hard nosed skeptics? Well, I, I, I'm not a psychiatrist. I, I don't want, and, you know, I don't really care what motivates them. And I think it's the, the mission of science to figure out what lies outside the solar system. And the government is tasked with national security risks. So if we find one in a million objects that happens not to be a rock, that came from outside the solar system and was manufactured by a technological civilization, that would be a great discovery for science, for humanity. I, I have to say on that friend, ever since I first interviewed you about Oumuamua, am I saying that right? Yes. Okay. Ever since I first interviewed you about that and I saw sort of the back and forth and you, you take a lot of heat for it, I, I was thinking to myself, you know, if it never turns out that there's alien tech or there's aliens, period, I am so glad there's a guy out there who in real time, when stuff comes to our planet that we don't understand, goes, I'm going to check it out. I'm just going to rule it out because I don't want somebody in a lab in 20, 30, 40 years poking at something going, oh, this isn't what we thought it was. That's too late. We need somebody who's enthusiastic right. about it, who's not just going to blow it off because they don't have the expectation that it could be anything else. Yeah. And after the committee delivered the report, they appointed a person who is not a scientist to simply transmit any data related to unidentified anomalous phenomena to send it directly to the Pentagon. So they filed this 
subject, not as a scientific matter, the way that Bill Nelson originally intended, but they filed it as a national security item where they want the Pentagon to look into it because most likely it's related to national security. And so that's where it stands right now. Oh, okay. So it's been designated as more likely a national security risk from adversaries on our planet. And that's why they yes. put it in that category. Okay. That's that's my understanding. Because And so obviously the outcome would have been different because I would be interested mostly in its uh, any scientific implication. You know, we have the Pentagon to look into national security. You know, NASA is not supposed to be an arm of the Pentagon. They are supposed to be a scientific research mission. You know, like they, sh- they are supposed to, to worry about you know, what lies outside the solar system. And and that was really the intention that I had in mind. They, they, I'm sorry. So now everything is going to be reported to the Pentagon because they had that wonderful panel where they identified all these UAPs. There was a mundane explanation for them. And it was great to just see that happening. In November 2024, John Koslowski, director of the Defense Department's All Domain Anomaly Resolution Office, Arrow, testified during a Senate Armed Service subcommittee hearing on his office's investigation into hundreds of unidentified anomalies phenomena, UAPs, or UFOs. Most were determined to be prosaic or lacking sufficient evidence for analysis, and 21 cases were flagged for further analysis due to anomalous characteristics. Oh yeah, no, but the, okay, so in the Pentagon there is the Old Domain Anomaly Resolution Office, which was actually established as a result of the first report of uh, Avril Haines to the Congress. Okay, so they established an organization in the Pentagon and they looked at hundreds of reports and concluded that 97% of them can be explained as human-made objects like drones, balloons. And in fact, there was a Chinese balloon that was shut down at some point a couple of years ago. So so that's the result of the, the report from the Director of National Intelligence. But you would expect the question to remain for the, the few percent. In the 1970s, Carl Sagan popularized the adage, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. This captures science's rigor in testing and validating new claims against existing knowledge, defending against misinformation, and preserving the integrity of the scientific process. But many have argued that an overemphasis on extraordinary evidence may desensitize us to subtle anomalies. And of course, what we consider extraordinary is relative to the limits of what we currently know. Like the fact that planets orbit stars was considered so extraordinary, people were persecuted for even suggesting it, and it took a long time to be accepted. Like multiple pre-Socratic philosophers hundreds of years BC speculated that the Earth was a sphere revolving around a central fire. Yet heliocentrism wasn't widely accepted until the 17th and 18th centuries, taking millennia to normalize what we now consider an unextraordinary fact about our universe. I think Loeb saying that the truly extraordinary claim has always been an assumption that we are extraordinary. So things like anomalous objects, especially those that survive scrutiny without explanation, require an extraordinary commitment to guard against our assumptions profound resistance to falsification. Even if one out of a hundred, one out of a thousand, or one out of a million objects is from outside of this earth, that would be of great interest to science. Maybe not so to the Pentagon, because they can be satisfied that they understand 99.9999% of the object. But uh, for a scientist like myself, I want to know if there is anything else. There was a testimony in Congress by David Grush, who argued that the, the US government does have programs for reverse engineering and a retrieval of materials from crash sites and they know about things that we don't know. This is why I'm kind of delighted that you're on the outside, because when I read that report, the chemical analysis of the sphere, spherules, spherules I, I kind of thought to myself, this would generally put this to bed. And then you came back and went, no, we're going to do more testing. And that being able to see that, having that open to the public, it, it's so reassuring to the rest of us. I know it's hard for you to get this kind of criticism, but that kind of dialogue and back and forth and reassessing the data and, and doing more tests is just exciting to watch and reassuring. And you get to exactly. see how science is done right. Exactly. That's the, the one important reason that I'm doing that is to show how science should be done. It's not. It should not be based on opinions of experts. It should be based on evidence. And the evidence can be collected even by 
high school kids, it's not a matter of seniority and there, there is no authority. You know, the truth is not in the hands of the authority. In the case of science, the truth is dependent on the evidence. And we should be uh, open-minded because if we don't search, we will not find anything. So the mistake made by many people is to have an opinion ahead of time, which quote unquote saves us time and resources because we already know the answer in advance. But guess what? Especially when there are anomalies, you want to actually examine the evidence. We invested in the Large Hadron Collider. We found the Higgs boson, which was old news. We really wanted to find new particles like the dark matter. We haven't found them. So why would the mainstream endorsement of this research agenda, which led to no detection of new particles, except for the Higgs boson that was anticipated, why is that more fruitful than going after anomalies that we know are unusual? It's just bad practice of science where you say, I, as the authority, I know that the objects must be stones, and I know that because of my past knowledge, and therefore the government data must be wrong, and therefore I know also what lies in the Pacific Ocean, and therefore it must be called, like all of these assumptions are completely opposite to the way science should be delivered. When I was at the Pacific Ocean, I had the, about 50 diary reports that I wrote and they were translated to Spanish. There were millions of people around the world that were reading them, following them. And one person from Denmark wrote to me an email while I was at, in the Pacific Ocean. He said, I had a stroke a couple of weeks ago and reading your essays gave me strength and just think about how much inspiration people draw from a simple act of just collecting materials and analyzing them instead of the act of having an opinion ahead of time. This is a good segue into what I really needed to talk to you about, which is I need a physicist's opinion about this. I, I've been talking to people in biology. Are you familiar with Stuart Kaufman and his his contributions to biology? No, I'm not familiar, but I saw some of the writings that you sent me. I need to give some context here. This part of the conversation has to do with my ongoing reporting on theories of the emergence of life, intelligence, and consciousness in the universe. Leading up to this, I've been covering developments in synthetic biology, in particular the work of developmental synthetic biologist Mike Levin and his Xenobots. Many of you have asked for a video with Mike, and that's in the works. Mike Levin and biologist Douglas Blackiston at the Allen Discovery Center at Tufts partnered with computer scientist Josh Bongard and Sam Krigman at the University of Vermont and used a supercomputer to give them an outline for a body shape of a tiny new organism that never existed before. Then they took frog cells and sculpted them into the design from the supercomputer. Then they watched as a whole new life form emerged. They call these creatures xenobots because the blueprint for their physical shape was designed by an AI on a supercomputer as a first in a new era of AI-designed bio-robots. But these new critters are 100% biological entities. The xenobots rapidly started to show behaviors like swimming, object manipulation, self-healing, self-assembly, and a form of self-replication, all without genetic modification and without any brains or nervous systems. Then with synthetic biologist and architect Gizem Gumushkaya, they created entirely new life forms out of human cells with human DNA called anthrobots. This research demonstrates an alternative pathway for life to emerge and evolve outside the standard gene-centric evolutionary model. Along with this research, there's a growing body of evidence about the strange places a sort of primitive intelligence is showing up, which has led biologists like Mike Levin to say things like, If you draw this kind of Venn diagram of what's, what's the set of all things that are alive and all the, the set of all things that are cognitive, I think life is a subset of the things that are cognitive. I do not think uh, that things that we typically call alive are the only things that uh, are amenable to the tools of uh, studying cognition. And uh, I think cognition was here first, and uh, life as a means of scaling it up it came after. This is what led me to complexity scientist and theoretical biologist Stuart Kaufman, who first proposed that life emerges from collectively autocatalytic sets, groups of molecules that spontaneously come together and assemble to form a self-generating chemical network. These systems are a coordinated collective of chain reactions where no single molecule can replicate itself independently, but the entire set organizes to catalyze each other's formation. And the mechanisms behind this have been demonstrated in molecular biology, single cell organisms, and chemical systems. 
Kaufman now thinks that the universe emerges through a similar pattern of behavior at the quantum level, where quantum particles, or clusters of quantum particles called quantum systems, exist in a superposition of potentia, of multiple potential states at once. These multiple possibilities are referred to as a wave function. Two or more quantum particles, or quantum systems, can cross paths in a way where their wave functions get entangled. And then whatever is possible for each of them changes together, even if they're separated across the universe. Einstein called this spooky action at a distance. It seems weird, but it doesn't violate any physical laws. This entangled relationship affects how quantum particles, or quantum systems, actualize, how their wave functions collapse or reduce, and they transition from a superposition of multiple potential states to a single fixed actual state. Kaufman thinks entangled quantum objects behave like molecules in collectively autocatalytic sets, creating each other or actualizing each other through their interactions to give rise to space, time, and the universe, echoing how collectively autocatalytic sets give rise to life. The particles of particle physics are autocatalytic. The particles really are capable of autocatalysis. You'd think physicists would be fascinated, like, what? I wrote the paper, and 22 people declined to review it. I would assume that there'd be a good reason given, given your, given your reputation, your credentials, that somebody might say, good shot. It's not a popular idea. An interpretation of quantum mechanics that might give legs to this idea is relational quantum mechanics, RQM, developed by physicist Carlo Rovelli that gets around the long-standing measurement problem at the heart of quantum mechanics. This is the problem of how quantum possibilities actualize or become concrete classical reality. In RQM, instead of a quantum wave function collapsing from multiple possible states into one actual state, Quantum systems exist as a sort of perpetual magic eight ball of possibilities. But when quantum systems collide, specific features or properties from that interaction spark into existence. So if you and I are two quantum systems and we interact, the words that I'm speaking and the sounds that you're hearing is the actualization of a unit of reality that emerges from our interaction. There is no absolute objective reality, according to RQM, only blips of reality that emerge from interactions of quantum objects. The sheer volume of these blips creates a densely interwoven web that we experience as a mutually consistent reality. So to make an albeit totally speculative connection between similar patterns of behavior at different scales, both reality itself and living chemistry seem to spontaneously emerge from a web of interactions where the parts of the system create or actualize each other through their interactions, eventually forming complex interconnected networks that we see as physical reality and each other. RQM appears to dispense with the traditional objective-subjective split between objective physical reality and the subjective mental properties of conscious experience, called qualia. Qualia is the quality of our experiences. It's a word that stands for all of the features or properties that populate consciousness, like the smell of coffee or the sound of laughing. While qualia have historically been considered fundamentally different from physical properties because of their ephemeral subjective nature, qualia are properties, and RQM suggests all properties, both mental and physical, are inherently relational. In the same way that properties like mass, charge, or momentum emerge from relations between systems, so might qualia. To investigate consciousness scientifically, we may have to treat qualia as equally real and relational as any other physical property. Like Michael Levin, Kaufman thinks that living things are a subset of things in the universe that can experience qualia and be cognitive and or conscious, though I need to stipulate that it's unclear to what extent life, mind, consciousness, and intelligence are related, something we'll be getting into much more with Mike Levin. Also, quantum effects in living organisms were thought impossible until relatively recently. With new experiments in biology and breakthroughs in large-scale molecular entanglement, so I was intrigued by Kaufman's ideas because of the role entanglement might play in organisms and maybe help explain words like coordination and cooperation that origins of life researchers use to describe emergent living systems. I think to solve life's origins, we'll need to look much more at cooperation and emerges really brings cooperation into the scene. 
whether you want it or not. If we talk about the universe at large, there are some very fundamental questions that are not really resolved. And perhaps what he's talking about is a, another path to looking at those problems. For example, we don't know what most of the matter in the universe is. It's called dark matter. 83% of the matter is a substance that we've never witnessed before. And we've known about it for more than 90 years uh, since uh, Fritz Wicke realized that there is some substance out there that is invisible. And we call it dark matter simply because it doesn't interact with light, but we don't know what it is. And in principle, it could also be that gravity behaves differently than we expect. So we think that there is another substance, but uh, we, we get it wrong because gravity is, is not correctly calculated at very low accelerations where dark matter shows up. So that's one aspect, of course. Another one is that we see the universe accelerating its expansion right now as, as a result of the vacuum having the so-called dark energy. Again, it's we don't know why. I'm just about to interview Adam for about that, Adam Reese. He was a student when I came to Harvard, 1993, January, and uh, I taught a class on cosmology. And Adam attended my class. And in my class, I said, by measuring distances uh, in cosmology, we can figure out the content of the universe. And, and in particular, figure out if it has a so-called cosmological constant, or now the, it's called the dark energy. So it turns out that Adam listened. I, I, I never know if the students are listening. And uh, he was intrigued. And then he developed a method to measure distances more precisely than before using uh, what's called the type 1a supernovae, making them basically just like light bulbs with a fixed wattage. Uh, if you know a light bulb is 100 watt, uh, then you can figure out the distance to it by measuring how much flux you get from it. Uh, so that's uh, the method, but type 1a supernovae were not precise enough at the time, but he was able to uh, use a correction to recalibrate their wattage and figure out how far they are. And then he got the Nobel Prize for measuring actually the expansion, th the fact that the universe is accelerating, there is a cosmological constant or a dark energy. So there's a lot going on in physics that's really bizarre. For instance, the discovery that the universe is non-local. That might be an overgeneralization. The quantum non-locality, the strange correlated relationship between entangled quantum particles, no matter how far apart they are, that Einstein called spooky action at a distance, is a fundamental aspect of nature at the quantum level. Now, one of the things that Stuart and a number of people are looking at is that evolution itself isn't something that we see in physics, like the thing constructing itself and adapting. And this phenomenon, they're trying to understand how it comes about, the origins of it, and how we can account for it in physics, right? Like, how do we how do we make sense of this? Yeah, this, this is very interesting. I mean, as you say, quantum mechanics is really the, the fundamental description of reality. It's not classical physics, the way Newton did uh, understand reality. And in quantum mechanics, there are always a number of uh, possibilities that are happening at the same time, unless, of course, you you collapse the wave fu the wave function describes the probability of of a system to be in different states and unless you measure the system and figure out in which state it it resides all of them coexist and so obviously biology relies on chemistry and chemistry is a product of quantum mechanics so at a fundamental level it's quite possible that quantum mechanics can explain things that otherwise with classical physics we don't now our bodies are big and therefore we tend to think classically about them, but but at the fundamental level, everything is quantum. Okay, so yeah. now let me ask you this then. He, so he's trying to devise a, a theory that can explain the stuff happening in biology, and mm -hmm. his papers are getting ignored. And when I talk to some physicists, it's like, yeah, because that doesn't look like a paper in physics. Like it's just missing all these crucial ingredients that um, somebody who's experienced in the field would have in that paper. How does somebody like Kaufman collaborate with somebody in physics or get even get you know an audience with somebody in physics to make his ideas make sense or to refute them right so it's very simple you know different cultures in science different areas of science uh, have their own vocabulary their own history and their own traditions and and very often practitioners in those areas respond to people they recognize so if someone comes from outside, well, that someone doesn't speak exactly the, the terminology that they speak, doesn't say the things that they're used to hear. So th there is a very simple way to enter such a field, and that is by collaborating with a practitioner within the field 
who can sort of do two things. One is translate it to the language that people speak in the field and explain it in ways that, uh, you know, all the practitioners understand. And second, uh, uh, supplement if needed, supplement the idea with examples and apply the idea to specific cases that the outsider may not recognize ahead of time because the outsider is not, is not familiar with the body of uh, evidence or data that exists out there. And it's not, not enough to just have studied it. You have to really be in the field to understand. Yeah. So that happens organically for young people who do their PhD and then end up in a postdoctoral fellowship and eventually become faculty because they are known to the community for many years. To me, you know, I, I did my PhD in a different field than I ended up doing my postdoc fellowship. So I started doing astrophysics just as I received a postdoc fellowship at Princeton. And, and it was extremely challenging in the first uh, five years because I had to learn the vocabulary. And moreover, people would just dismiss uh, what I say because I, they didn't recognize me. You started out where and you ended up where? What was your... your... I started, uh, well, actually, as a kid, I was interested in philosophy. Uh, but then uh, I had to serve in the military because I was born in Israel. It's uh, mandatory there. And so I, the closest thing that I could follow was physics, which is useful for the defense of the country. And I was recruited to a program. And during that program, at age 24, I received my PhD in physics. Uh, but it always felt like an arranged marriage, like unnatural for me. Nevertheless, I received an offer from the, the Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton for a five-year fellowship. And there was a condition that I switched to astrophysics. I was working at the time on plasma physics, which is the physics of uh, materials when you heat them to very high temperatures in explosions, for example. I pioneered the first international project that was funded by President Reagan in the context of the Star Wars initiative in the mid-1980s. That's what brought me to the US and eventually to Princeton. And so one thing led to another. And by chance, I ended up in astrophysics. But I remember very vividly the first five years being extremely difficult, even though I was young, to learn the vocabulary, the way people express themselves. I, I had no idea. I didn't know how the sun shines, for example. And th that was embarrassing. And the second is to get recognized. So people will invite me to conferences. People will listen to what I have to say. It's much more difficult for someone senior to do all these things. So a shortcut could be to collaborate with a senior member of the community that you want your ideas to be recognized in. Because if he were to collaborate with a senior partner from cosmologists, then that cosmologist could help translate the ideas into more familiar terms for the practitioners, but also relate them to data. So there, I mean, the chances are somebody coming from biology, it's not that they're just not speaking the right language. They wouldn't have the the foundational knowledge to be able to write a paper with any legitimacy in this space until they actually were immersed in that field. Well, they could uh, learn it by themselves, but it takes time and a shortcut that would be quite helpful because any collaboration brings not only, it, it's not just a matter of changing the language, but also uh, expressing the ideas in the context of things that are already known, the data. And so that's that would be my recommendation, just for Stuart to establish a collaboration with a senior cosmologist, uh, as long as he needs to convince, of course, the senior cosmologist to to follow this uh, research path. but So uh, that is my follow-up question because I've spoken to physicists who have told me, that they will, won't put their names on the record, but they've said that their inboxes are filled with people who have grand theories about the universe. And it can be people who are well-established in other fields, but they're just, the reason we're getting radio silence from physicists is because they're polite, but they're dealing with this all the time. And it's just, I've heard like it's just comical, some of these papers, even though the ideas might somehow be smart, they're just missing major pieces in the field. Well, one cannot, one, this is a prejudice, of course, to say, because, you know, Albert Einstein, where he came up with this theory of relativity and, and people in the mainstream, if you look back 1892, there was a lecture by Michelson during the inauguration of a new laboratory at the University of Chicago, Laboratory of Physics, where Michelson, who at the time was a very distinguished physicist, said that there is not much to be discovered in physics. In 1892, that he thought that the most important discoveries were made already. And from now on, we just need to figure out the fundamental constants to the fifth decimal point. A famous end of science prediction came in 1894 during the speech given by soon-to-be Nobel laureate Albert A. Michelson. 
the more important fundamental laws and facts of physical science have all been discovered, and these are now so firmly established that the possibility of their ever being supplanted in consequence of new discoveries is exceedingly remote. Future discoveries must be looked for in the sixth place of decimals. That was his view. And just a decade later, Albert Einstein came with special theory of relativity. A decade after that, the general theory of relativity. A decade after that, quantum mechanics was discovered. And that changed the entire landscape of physics. So when people tell you our inboxes are full, of course, that's what Michelson would have said if Albert Einstein would have sent him his paper in 1905. He would say, you know, physics is over, our inbox is full, who is this young guy? I don't need to listen. I get too many of those. But the point is you have to be open-minded, you have to allow for surprises. So it really depends on who sends you the message and what the content is. Maybe he reached out to the wrong people. He's reached out to journals too, and they've given them the same response. To be clear, Kaufman is a prolific researcher. On top of his origins of life research, he laid the theoretical foundations for how genetic networks self-regulate and for cancer differentiation therapy, which reprograms cancer cells instead of killing them. And he developed a method to test thousands of chemical compounds at once to accelerate drug discovery. Kaufman has over 500 peer-reviewed papers, including this one accepted for publication at an Elsevier biology journal as I was interviewing him, with a referee commenting, This work, at first glance, would seem a visionary and speculative paper stuffed by fancy flights, but in the end is not. Where Kaufman's running into trouble is with physics journals. Oh, the journal. Okay, journals, I should say, well, the editors are not more qualified than, I mean, at best, they are as qualified as the scientists, very often less than that, if the, these are administrators. So journals are responding to the way the community responds. And it's really, you know, you need to find uh, innovative individuals. You see, most of the practitioners in physics and in any field, most of them are conservative. They are just establishing echo chambers where they repeat the mantras that were said for many years so that they get their voice loud and they get they want to maximize the funding they get to maximize honors and awards. And you do that by amplifying messages that you already know from the past. And uh, if you were to take a risk, you are losing time and you might actually be wrong. And so that's why most uh, scientists just don't innovate. They repeat what is already known. So when he is reaching out to scientists, they might tell you that they are too busy to look at what he says. But the truth is that they want to avoid risks because if they make a mistake, they might get less funding and have a less lesser chance of getting awards. You know, there are examples of Fred Hoyle, a very distinguished cosmologist and astronomer at the University of Cambridge in England, who late in life took risks and argued that the universe is steady, doesn't really expand. He also argued that bacteria or life can be transported by dust, interstellar dust. In both of these cases, most likely he was wrong based on what we know today. I mean, in the case of cosmology, for sure he was wrong. But there is the claim that he would have gotten the Nobel Prize if he didn't take those risks. Mathematician and astronomer Fred Hoyle coined the term Big Bang, even though he rejected the view that the universe started with a Big Bang. Hoyle held a number of controversial views, one of which was panspermia, the idea that life didn't originate on Earth, but dispersed across the cosmos on comets and space dust. He also thought that evolution on Earth is influenced by a steady stream of viruses transported on comets. Hoyle is probably most famous for his validated theory for how the universe uses stars to make new elements in a process called stellar nucleosynthesis. And although Hoyle was the pioneer of this groundbreaking work, only his collaborator, William Fowler, won the Nobel Prize for it. It's rumored that Hoyle's snubbing is because he publicly denounced the Nobel Committee for honoring radio astronomer Anthony Hewish in 1974 for the discovery of pulsar stars, when it was Hewish's PhD student, Jocelyn Bell Burnell, who actually first discovered pulsars. Finally, in 2018, Belle Burnell was awarded a $3 million breakthrough prize for her discovery, which she pledged to women, refugees, and underrepresented minorities in physics because she felt like a physics outsider herself. Science is a very sort of conservative culture, and many people just avoid out-of-the-box ideas just in order not to risk themselves. So if you were him, or if you were trying to do a collaboration in the life sciences to answer some questions in physics, how would you, and you're getting turned down by journals, and nobody 
your friends even in these fields are responding to you, what yeah. would you do? Well, it's not a matter of friendship because they worry about funding and honors. Okay, so I would simply approach individuals who are known to be innovative. So for example, you know, there are individuals who consider a solution to the dark matter problem in terms of modified gravity. Okay, for example, I mean, I can provide names. And so uh, those are people who think creatively, even in the context of the dark matter that people who think outside the box. So what he needs to identify is people willing to take risks because those are the people who are also open-minded enough to listen to alternative views. That would be my advice for him to contact people who are open-minded, who are basically innovators rather, rather than, you know, like most uh, scientists, most practitioners are drilling in a niche. They become experts, world experts. And the problem with that is that very often you hit the bedrock of the subject and you can't really move sideways because you became the expert in a very narrow niche. When people are like that, they don't see the full picture, the landscape, and they don't want to deviate from what they already know. So that's why he's finding this resistance. But the way out of that is to speak with the people that are like-minded, that are willing to contemplate innovative ideas. Do you think, Avi, do you have any ideas, proposals for how we could do science better to avoid these blind spots? Or do you think this is necessary to sort of have the, the majority of science just be very critical and resistant to new things because otherwise we might fall into wooey, wooey, whatever? Yeah. What, what are your thoughts? So actually a decade ago, I wrote an, an opinion essay and published it in Nature magazine that made the analogy between academic research and financial investments. What makes most sense is to have a fraction of your portfolio invested in risky propositions that are equivalent to stocks and a fraction invested in secure investments like bonds. And I recommended to young people to put maybe 30% of their time into risky, innovative ideas, not zero, like many people do. But the exact proportions depends on your willingness to take risks. The balanced portfolio is really important if you want to make a difference, because if you only invest in bonds, you will just become indistinguishable from the rest of the community. If you want to make a difference, you really need to take some risks and sometimes go in the wrong direction. You see it from the commercial sector, where innovation relies on willingness to fail. A week ago, I had my birthday and there was a surprise party at the Institute for Theory and Computation that I'm the director of. And one of the students asked me, what's your advice to young people beyond the diversified portfolio? I said that when Picasso, Pablo Picasso started painting, he painted very realistically the way other people painted before him. And later on, he started venturing into cubism and abstract painting. And when he was asked why he started with realistic paintings, he said that he wanted to master the craft uh, of painting the way it was done before him first. That's my advice to young people. First, you want to demonstrate that you master the craft, that you are able to do what other people are doing. You, you are able to do it even better. And once you do that and you show to other people that you are very capable in the way they are doing the craft, they are doing the science, then you can start innovating with a diversified portfolio. But ultimately, until you get the tenured appointment, you don't want to be too risky because you still need to convince selection committees and promotion committees that you deserve the promotion. Once you become independent, once you get tenure, which is really unique to academia, then you don't depend on others. And then you can innovate as much as you want. Unfortunately, most people, when they get to that phase, they are already indoctrinated and they are already very careful not to deviate from the beaten path. They got used to playing within the box, thinking within the box. They also obviously think that they would not get funded as much and will not get supported as much in terms of honors, awards, and students and so forth, unless they take the beaten path. And that is really bad for scientific progress because it would have been accelerated if people were willing to take risks to make mistakes by going into directions that other people do not explore. I think this is really critical for the success of the scientific endeavor. Do you think that being counterculture and fighting the, the tide of the norm actually makes the outliers better scientists? Same for artists. Like, Do you think that that's actually a critical ingredient? Oh, I, I can tell you from experience that I have to really be perfect in order not to be immediately ridiculed or 
And when I do my science, I have to make sure uh, by checking it again and again when I write papers that there is no slight deviation from what uh, we are confident about because there is a lot of scrutiny. When you innovate, there is a lot of uh, pushback and you have to do much better than a typical. If you look at a typical paper in the scientific literature, you know, many statements are clumsy, not careful, very often wrong, but uh, people don't get scrutinized because nobody cares about it. Maybe a few papers, uh, a few people read those papers, including their freeze, but that's pretty much it. You know how we have labor unions to protect laborers. Do we need a body or laws in place to protect, you know, from discrimination against ideas in science? I think so. I think so. I think that the notion that diversity is important in academia was applied to people in terms of uh, ethnic background, gender, sexual orientation, and so forth. But uh, most, the most important aspect of it is actually diversity of ideas, especially at Harvard. For a while, that was not the case because it's not just a matter of ideas, or scientific ideas, but also political ideas. Only to and a half percent of the Harvard faculty uh, define themselves as conservatives. And that's not a reflection of the American society. And when students come from conservative homes, they probably feel alienated. And, and the Harvard leadership, part of the reason it got into trouble is because they went into the extreme of one side of the political map. A university is not supposed to be political. It's a goal of alleviating polarization, alleviating tensions rather than enhancing them by siding with one side of the political spectrum. To answer your question, it's not only a matter of having a safe space for people who innovate and supporting them and encouraging them, but making it the desired practice, uh, something that is the way science should be rewarded and providing awards to people who innovate, you know, and not just to uh, people who traditionally were following the beaten path and, and made a, a small contribution along that path. So in fact, appreciating that much more because it requires much more effort. Most importantly, it's the issue of funding because the way funding is allocated right now is that federal organizations and also at the foundations, you have committees that are populated by mainstream scientists who either provide the funding to people who think like they do by arguing, you know, we have limited funds, we should not take risks, we should just do something where the outcome is clear. That is a contradiction because uh, the most significant contributions to science will come from directions that were not pursued in the past, that are risky. And of course, you will lose money on some uh, research projects, but you're taking the risk and uh, hoping that one out of tens of of uh, such uh, innovative ideas, one of them would be successful and would provide, you know, much more abundance of knowledge and, 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 and ideas than the traditional path would give if you were to follow it alone. And, and so I, you know, I think that funding is really important. And now that there is so much money in the hands of individuals, it didn't used to be the case, but with the tech revolution, with the internet, there are many, I mean, billionaires that I meet, you know, over the past decade, I was supported only by private foundations and individuals, not, not by uh, federal support. There is interest from those people to help the progress of science. They do see the light, uh, but the infrastructure does not exist except for some foundations that were established by those individuals. And the important point is not to appoint, not to, to make uh, selection committees out of those mainstream conservative scientists, but it's really the key is in the people who make the choice of who to award the money to. And one way to do it is people who are known to innovate, put them on the committee so that whenever they identify an innovator, that innovator can be added to the committee. So there will be a community of innovators that are supporting each other because they really understand what it's like to innovate rather than having out people that are not innovators deciding whether to give money to innovators. Yeah, I returned to university to, to a grad program after years of being out of school, and I am shocked at what I'm seeing. Like, I cannot believe the polarization ideology that's taken hold. So how do we deal with whole departments, whole universities? Who, they don't know they have one ideology because when they talk to me, they go, well, nobody thinks like that. I'm like, well, everybody in another department does. Like, how How do you, even, I don't even know how to negotiate that, much less yeah. make a case for the thing I'm thinking about. Yeah, that's one of the problems in academia. You have these bubbles that are not aware of uh, the problem. And how do we know that this is the situation? Because when the bubble gets into friction with the outside world, the way it happened in Congress with the president of Harvard, clearly that generates a lot of heat and uh, turmoil. So that's an indication that there is a mismatch between 
the bubble within, let's say, Harvard University and the outside world. And the bubble would continue to justify itself by saying, oh, the friction is with outsiders who belong to a different political branch that we disagree with. This is the wrong approach. In my view, there needs to be a correction. It's like the GPS system telling you, you have to recalculate your path. The best way to do that is by bringing new people, by uh, changing the leadership such that the leadership, the new leadership will get feedback because it's all about the feedback loop. If the feedback loop is broken, if you don't hear criticism, you don't really understand what the criticism is about, you make it political, then you will never correct course. My main criticism uh, academically is that we see a lot of development in technology like artificial intelligence, chat GPT, that will revolutionize society. We also hear from the humanities that not many students are going there, they don't get much funding. And to me, the solution is obvious. They just need to be the humanities of the future rather than the humanities of the past. Instead of teaching Aristotle, Plato, yeah, I agree, these were very smart people, but they didn't have computers. And and now we have a new reality and we have to worry about the ethical implications. We have to worry about uh, how to uh, rearrange the legal system around those technologies. And politicians in Washington, D.C. are not aware of what needs to be done. And it's the task of academia, of the humanities, to actually figure out the path forward instead of concentrating on the past. So I'm an optimist. I think any change could be for the better if you know how to adapt to it. And it's the duty of people working in the humanities, people who work, you know, in, on computer science to attend to these new developments, attend to the challenge of adapting society to them. Frankly, academia is failing because it's unable to adapt to innovation. And we talked about it before in the context of my research, but it comes to fruition also in the in, in other contexts like AI, in, in the context of politics and so forth. So unless there would be recalculation of the system, unless there would be restructuring, academia will become less relevant to society. That sort of leads to what I want to ask you, which is that like in the humanities, I'm fact checking the core text, like the, the, the scholarly text that everybody has to read, the citations that are supposed to support the claim say something completely different. It's really concerning because this is the training data for AI. This is the the best training data for AI. And we're all concerned about these machines getting it wrong. My, my sort of pet hypothesis right now is that we are so much more fallible than we think. And I wonder how widespread this is, not intentionally. Oh yeah, it is widespread. A couple of weeks ago, I was at the Munich Security Conference, which is a political event with heads of state. I spoke about space and why we should be humble. Many of us didn't get the message that cosmic history is not about us. We are not the main actors. And in that context, I was invited by the Polish government to give a keynote speech at the town where Nicolaus Copernicus was born. 550 years ago, they celebrated that. And my talk was about the next Copernican revolution. Nicolaus Copernicus, he was a priest. He wanted to help the church. The church could not figure out how to forecast when Easter takes place. They got it off by a few days because they had a model of the universe where the earth is at the center. Copernicus realized that by putting the sun at the center, he can predict when Easter takes place. So he gave the model to the church and uh, they were very happy about it. And they said, thank you so much, but this is a theoretical model. It works very well. We will use it, but it has nothing to do with reality because the earth is at the center of the universe. And by the way, we will ban your book. And the book was in the forbidden list of books until the 19th century for hundreds of years. It's been half a millennium after he passed away. And there is still this tendency of a lot of people to think that we are important and privileged. So not only are we as a planet not the center of the universe, we as a mind aren't the center of the universe. Exactly. That, In fact, um, very soon we will realize that we are not the most intelligent entities on, on Earth. We are now developing technological products. Uh, artificial intelligence is uh, getting to the point where those systems have more connections than the human brain, and perhaps they are beyond us by now. There was even the statement a few months ago that once the chat GPT started interacting with people, it became dumber. <laughs> and, I read and, that. Uh, there are lots of people who th still argue that there is nothing like us, and, but at some point it will become 
obvious. We have to understand the machine is basically a mirror. We are building it following the imitation game of Alan Turing 90 years ago. The idea is that you want to create a machine in the image of humans. Religions were saying humans are in the image of God. Now we, we generate AI in the image of humans and we don't like what we see. It's a reflection on us, not on the AI. If you let uh, an AI system learn from the internet, including the dark corners of human civilization where bad things are happening, it will do bad things. Oscar Wilde said the imita imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. We just shouldn't be surprised when AI mirrors us. If AI, obviously it has access to restaurant menus and it would realize that, you know, we keep eating animals without any remorse. We kill and eat animals that we think are less intelligent than we are. So what's the next step? That once AI would feel that it's most, more intelligent than we are, it would hurt people, obviously. Wow, I never quite went there with that, but that 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 is the value system there would translate. If it's smart enough, it would say the right things, but do the wrong things. It cannot be arrogant for too long. Eventually, there is even on Earth, someone smarter than us. And so I'm saying there are hundreds of billions of stars in addition to the sun in the Milky Way galaxy and a substantial fraction of them, maybe a quarter, has a planet like the Earth, roughly at the same separation. So what's the chance that Albert Einstein was the smartest scientist who ever lived since the Big Bang 13.8 billion years ago? It's very small. Why don't we pay attention to them, search for them, seek evidence so that we can learn from them? You know, when Enrico Fermi said, where is everybody? That is very presumptuous. He said, where is everybody? When he was having lunch in Los Alamos in 1951, he couldn't see anyone around him any alien. We all know that if you stand at home and say, I don't see any partner around me, you know, that's the wrong attitude. You have to go to dating sites to find partners. You at least need to look out of the window. Enrico Fermi didn't do that. Elon Musk didn't do that when he said at the beginning of 2024, or he gave a forecast for Starship, he was saying, I don't see anyone. And therefore, we have a great responsibility to, to go to Mars uh, so that we will not be destroyed by a single point catastrophe on earth and, and i say well it's very irresponsible to say i haven't seen any aliens without seeking them new knowledge is always a result of some effort if we didn't invest 10 billion dollars in the large hadron collider we would never find the higgs boson if we didn't invest 10 billion dollars in the web telescope we wouldn't find the first galaxies, the first stars. So we, we have the obligation to, to invest in the search before we say that we, where is everybody? Fermi's paradox is the question of why, given all the planets in our galaxy, why haven't we seen signs of aliens? It's argued that we might be the only planet in the universe capable of supporting life, or that we might be the first living things to emerge in the universe, or that intelligent civilizations came before us and destroyed themselves. There are Fermi paradox papers that offer alternative views, like the homeostatic awakening paper that proposes that many alien civilizations extinct themselves, so of course we don't see them, but some alien civilizations might realize that they can't endlessly consume and grow and try to dominate everything without annihilating themselves in the process. So instead, they kind of go hermit and focus on staying small and on balance and sustainability, which is why we don't see them. Another paper resurrects Fred Hoyle's panspermia theory and combines it with Fermi's paradox, suggesting that when we search for extraterrestrial intelligence, we're focusing on human-like intelligence and overlooking microbial intelligence. Microbes are ancient life forms, far more likely to be found throughout space. They're creatures with extraordinary longevity and the ability to form interconnected communication networks that can blanket entire planets or multiple planets. Microbes may have a form of intelligence so different from ours that we simply fail to see it. We may also have misprioritized a search for life as astrobiologists are pushing to expand the definition and scientists like Mike Levin think cognition came first that life as we know it is a chemical scaffold or substrate for scaling cognition. And intelligence may be far more diverse and plentiful across the universe if we open our eyes and try to see it. Where is everybody? Well, they are glued to their screens. And to me, it gives actually an answer to Fermi's paradox. Those aliens, you know, the aliens near an exoplanet, they do not care much about us in the real world. They're glued to their screen. They're surfing the internet. That's a really interesting take. I had the same assumption that social media was just destroying people. 
but I thought it was the algorithm. And then I started reading studies on it and it turns out it's more actually us and our comments and the way we're treating each other. So it's how you use this technology. Like social media is destructive for our self-esteem, but if you lose your dog, you can find your dog like that because it just goes like wildfire and you get like a restored faith in humanity. That's an excellent point because every technological tool that we developed can be used for bad or good purposes. And it's really a question of us adapting to it in a way that will be constructive. You're completely right. So for example, nuclear energy, we can use it for clean energy and you can use it for atomic weapons. And obviously, you know, it can destroy a lot of things if we use it badly. And so it all, it's all a question of what we make of it. And and you are exactly right. It's, it's a very efficient tool to do good things, actually, social media. Obviously, if you look at the news every day, you would conclude that, that there is a lot of room for improvement. We are engaged mostly in conflicts. Well, maybe if women were to rule, you know, if women were in charge, it would have been better. But as of now, there are two wars going on and there are two trillion dollars a year invested in military budgets. And, you know, it's really not a sign of intelligence to kill other people when we all live for such a short time. What's the point? So that's why there is a lot of interest to the question of whether we have a neighbor, a cosmic neighbor. And if we have a neighbor, let's find out because then we can adapt to it. And my hope is that it will bring humanity to a more sensible place. Your point about the web, too, is interesting because it's also uh, disabusing us of a whole bunch of assumptions we thought were were concrete. Yeah, actually, I uh, am responsible for many of those predictions for the first stars, the first galaxies, because about uh, 30 years ago when I arrived to Harvard, there weren't many people interested in this subject. And since then, I, you know, I had many students, uh, I wrote two textbooks and made a forecast for what the Webb Telescope finds. And when I was asked, what do you hope for? And I said, I hope that the Webb Telescope will show something that is in conflict with what we predicted, because that will teach us something new. You know, that's the whole point about doing science. It's learning something you didn't know before. Being curious and being willing to make mistakes, you know, is the only way to learn. As far as I'm concerned, it's the only reason uh, for my life. I'm very glad that the Webb Telescope is surprising us. It's fantastic. <laughs>